I understand that the announcement went out with just my name on it, and uh, all of you figured it'd be really short. <laughs> I'm the accountant. That's the penalty you pay. <laughs> so, uh, but but one of my favorite cartoons is of a of a and a, a guy with a trench coat on and a hat, he says, just because I'm an accountant doesn't mean I'm not dangerous. <laughs> <clears throat> we do have a broken budget process, and uh, it occurred to me that uh, Congress is kind of like a binge eater. We want to diet right after the next dessert, and we all have an idea for a recipe for a dessert. It'll be just a little different than anything anybody else has done, and it'll be really good, and it will save money. Just had to put a little investment up front. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, that's how we got to the problem, which is $20, mil $20 trillion in debt, headed to $29 trillion in debt. Now, I usually don't use the word trillion because uh, that's a thousand billion. And one of anything doesn't sound like nearly as much as a thousand of something. Uh, it's a huge problem. The Budget Act was passed 40 years ago, and it's been followed to completion four times in 40 years. So there's something wrong. Now, I passed a budget last year. It was the first one to balance since 2001. Got to remind you that in 2001, they were able to stick a whole lot of Social Security bonds in a drawer and spend the money. But uh, this one had to balance in spite of that. Um, the budget lasted five months. And then there was a spectacular deal to keep government operating. And uh, depending on which numbers you use, that cost us about uh, $76 billion to balance. No, to be able to spend what we wanted to spend. 70% um, of the budget's on autopilot. We don't get to discuss that part at all. Uh, the payments are automatic and they're in law, and that forces the other 30% to use budget gimmicks. Um, we often fake a loan from the future. An example of that would be the uh, bill that we passed last week on water development that had a little piece in there for Flint, Michigan. Uh, earlier, when we were having a, a bit of a recession, we gave some incentive to automobile dealers that would do electric cars. Well, the incentive didn't work out very well, so there's a lot of money left in that fund. But that was an emergency fund. You remember these were all supposed to be for shovel-ready projects? So the money was supposed to be spent right away to get it out into the economy so that the economy would blossom and grow? Well, it hasn't been used. Well, parts of it have been used. But in that bill, they were asking to use what's left in 2020 and move that forward and spend it right now. $299 million. Uh, that was the amount of overspending. Um, there isn't any money to move forward because that was an emergency money, which means we invented it. That's one of the problems we've got. We can invent money by causing emergencies. And incidentally, the emergencies never end. There's no ending date for them. That's why in 2020, some of this money can be, can be used. So we fake a loan from the future, and we use emergencies. Now, when I came to the Senate, I noticed that there were $5 billion worth of emergencies every year, from forest fires to hurricanes to earthquakes and other things. $5 billion a year. And I said, so if you know you're going to have $5 billion worth of expenditures, why isn't that part of the budget? Well, it's too hard to get the money if you don't make it an emergency. So you'll notice in last year's budget, we also put in, it's escalated a bit, it's not $7 billion a year. So I put in $7 billion a year through all 10 years uh, for emergencies. Um, some years it doesn't cover it, some years it's more than enough. Uh, another little problem we have is budget formats. I discovered this is budget chairman. The president has a format for bu his budgets, which is the same ones we work with. But the budget committee has a different format than the president's format for the same dollars. 
And then the Appropriations Committee has a different format than the President or the Budget Committee. And I'm pretty convinced that that's intentional. <laughs> it's so you can't follow the money. The audits don't work then. And uh, even within the administration budget, the audits don't work because the Department of Defense uses a slightly different formula for how they uh, notate things and what, where, how they allocate things than the Treasury does, who's supposed to be keeping track of it. Another problem we've got is we don't look at old programs. I mentioned this diet, you know, we want more dessert. Well, we've been doing a lot of desserts over the years. When I got here, I noticed that we had, because I was uh, on health, education, labor, and pensions and was the chairman of it for a while, and uh, I noticed that we had 145, 119 preschool programs. 119. I looked to see what the difference was. The main difference was that they were named for a different senator. <laughs> and I checked to see how they were working. And most of them had evolved from an educational process to a babysitting service. Now, you shouldn't pay the same amount for a babysitting service that you do for an educational program. So I started eliminating them. I got to talk to a lot of mothers and children. But we got them into babysitting services, if that's what they were really looking for. Uh, the educational programs usually required that the mother or dad or both be at the sessions for part of the session so that they could learn as the child learned. But at any rate, I got that down with Senator Kennedy's help to 65 programs. And since that time, I've gotten it down to 45 programs. Now, one of the difficulty with reducing the programs is that they're in all different agencies. I didn't have jurisdiction over most of those. You can't eliminate something you don't have jurisdiction over. So two years ago, on one of the bills, I was able to get an amendment passed almost unanimously that those have to be reduced down to five programs and all be put under one department, the Department of Education. Um, it passed, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, I've had a plan for a long time with the federal debt, and that's the penny plan. Um, I figured out that if we just took one cent off of every dollar that the federal government spends and did it until we start balancing the budget, we could do that in seven years. Now, I've been talking about this every place, including senior centers, and because uh, it would include Social Security. It would include all of the mandatory spending that we do, as well as the other spending. And uh, I'm pretty sure that if we did that, after one year, people would say, you know, that, that, that hurt, but it didn't hurt that bad. If I can save this country for my grandkids, I'll go 2%. Now we've got it down to three years. Three years is where we need to be. Um, now I've been trying to balance the budget since I got here, and I've been sending back 20 to 25% of my own budget each year. Doesn't make much of a dent, though. Our budgets are passed out according to population of your state. <laughs> I have the least populous state in the nation, so I get the least to budget with, but I'm still able to send back 20, 25%. Interest rates are going to eat us alive. That's why we have to do something, and we have to do something right now. We're almost at $20 trillion, $20,000 billion. Now, it's pretty easy to do the math at 1%. 1% interest on that is $200 billion a year. Doesn't buy you anything. Um, but that's not the norm. The norm for us is 5% for the government. If it goes to that, and I think it could go to that in the next three years, multiply that 200 billion times five, and you come up with 1,000 billion. You know how much we get that isn't mandatory spending? A thousand and seventy billion. Now that includes defense, it includes highways, it depends, it includes almost everything you can think of that's a regular expenditure of the federal government. It even includes federal employees. So I don't know how we'd spread that seventy billion dollars out. We're not going to be able to. We're going to have to make changes, and we're going to have to make drastic changes. Now I'm from a state that knows how to make changes. 
Uh, Wyoming's had a balanced budget requirement since it became a state. And uh, we're in a little bit of a throw right now because um, they've been doing in coal mines. And my county provides 40% of the nation's coal. So in one week, hundreds of employees got laid off. And uh, the president did say that if you're not a coal miner, this won't affect you. Um, the railroad employees the next week who were laid off by the thousands didn't believe him. And that sifted down through the economy. And here's, here's what it's done to the economy. We have a rule that if the legislature can see something coming, they have to make the cuts during the 20 days that they do the budget. It's a set time every year for every other year for doing it. They do biennial budgeting. So they cut 8% out of the budget. Well, when the next revenue reviews came in, we found out that wasn't enough. Well, when they're not in session, the governor has to make those cuts. So the governor made another 8% of cuts. Now, he's discovered since that the economy is going down even more. So he said, you know, we have to do another round of those. But I think I'll leave that for the legislature. <laughs> the legislature will be meeting in January. I'm sure they're thrilled. Um, but that'll be 24% out of the budget. Can you imagine if we cut 24% out of the federal budget in one year? The whole federal budget? Wow. Can't do that. We're going to have to have some solutions that will uh, get things going. Uh, another problem we've got is regulations. They're driving down the gross domestic product. That's the private se sector productivity. And an inter interesting statistic that I found on that was that if the economy improved by just 1%, the federal government would have $430 billion more to spend without raising taxes. Where is the economy gone? 2.7 down to half a percent. That's a thousand billion dollars that we've lost. So I just got a report that uh, the overspending for this year is now projected to be 590 billion dollars. How significant is that? I told you that we only get to make decisions on a thousand and seventy billion. So that's a pretty gross overspending. Of course, it isn't all out of the discretionary funds. Um, the other funds go up too, even though they're mandatory. But when they go up, we have to take the money out of the discretionary money. So there's less and less to work with for defense and highways and all the education, all the other things that we do. So. I don't get invited to speak a lot of places because it's so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> but there are solutions, and we've been working on those as a, as a committee in a bipartisan way. We've been holding a bunch of hearings to see what other countries are doing, how businesses do it, how other governments do it, how states do it. Uh, there aren't a lot of states that we can draw on for uh, positive solutions, but there are some, and we've gotten some. Um, I'll start with some of the bipartisan solutions. One of them is put everything on the budget. Now, of course, that would get a huge outcry. So I've, I've phrased that a different way. Let's put everything on the budget that doesn't have a source of revenue sufficient to cover the expenses each and every year. What I did was just put everything on budget because none of them have the dollars to sustain themselves out of the revenue that's been dedicated to them. Highways is one of those examples. We're stealing the money from other places now to build highways. Highways used to get gas tax and gas tax covered not only highways but all the other transportation infrastructure. But we've decided that we don't want to raise taxes, so uh, we don't do that. Now in Wyoming they said, well, if we're not going to get that federal money, we better raise our gas tax. And they raised the gas tax in spite of all the threats that everybody had begun. And the uh, surprising thing was nobody lost their job over that because they saw the need for the highways to be better and said that that's the logical way to fund it, something that's directly related to the project that's being done. We don't do much of that around here. Um, another idea we've got for solving the budget crisis is to have 
mandatory floor time for appropriations. Set aside two or three months each year that you just do appropriations. Now, we ought to skip the cloture motion for the, the to proceed to that particular appropriation. That's kind of, we got to talk about them anyway. There's still an opportunity if they want to filibuster to do that at the end of the process. But that's after you cover what the spending could be. Um, so a mandatory time for appropriations. I mentioned Wyoming has, has that. Their budget session's 20 days, and that's all you can talk about unless, unless you can get a two-thirds vote of the people with absolutely no debate. <laughs> that's an emergency. Okay. Another thing we do is waive the small budget points of order, which cause extra votes, but put a bigger trigger for the bigger expenditures. Right now in the Senate, it takes 60 votes to pass a bill. Well, it also takes 60 votes to waive a point of order. So if you're going to be able to pass the bill anyway, you're not worried about the point of order. But sometimes those are huge points of order. So both sides have agreed there need to be a bigger trigger for large violations. Another thing we'd like to institute is a table of resources for a portfolio approach. That means it'd be a connection between spending and results, and we'd create budget subcommittees that would do portfolio reviews of expenditures. Now, what am I talking about here? Um, let me give you an example. In the housing area, we have 140 housing programs, kind of like preschool programs, um, 140 housing programs administered by 20 departments. Now, you'd think, well, some of them must have seven, some of them must have 10, some of them must have... No, all 140 are dabbled in by all 20, all 20 agencies. Nobody's in charge, nobody sets goals, nobody checks to see if the housing is actually providing housing for the people that were anticipated to get housing. Uh, we met with some folks from New Zealand who went to this portfolio approach, and housing was one of their portfolio areas. And they'd, they'd, been, they'd, they'd found that they had a lot of homeless people, and most of them were ex-military people. And uh, so they wanted to build a bunch of housing for the military. And they did. But they review it every year. And they reviewed it the next year, and they had just as many homeless veterans as they had before. So they said, hmm, maybe we're not doing the right thing. When they looked into it, they said, mental health. These people are living out there because they're afraid of everything or have a number of issues that they just don't want to be enclosed in anything. So they shifted the money to mental health and they reduced homelessness. So we've got, we've got to get to some kind of a, a process where there's a, a portfolio with somebody in charge, there are requirements, there are goals, and we check to see if they meet the goals. If they meet the goals, maybe we give them more money. And if they don't meet the goals, we take a look at what those goals were and figure out why they didn't work. Another thing we do is eliminate the Votorama. I don't know if you've witnessed that, but uh, both in committee and on the floor, we have this process where you don't have to turn your amendment in in advance. You can turn it in up to the very last minute before the final vote, and it has to be voted on, unless you personally decide not to have a vote on it. And people usually wear out after a couple of weeks of doing that. They're usually just uh, political points that are being made and have really no relation to whether we're going to increase spending or decrease spending. Um, but we've agreed to eliminate that voterama. Um, it's, it's, it's in committee, it's really, well, and on the floor, it's an ambush approach because you don't know what's coming. Um, when I became the budget chairman, I went to Senator Sanders and said, uh, I know that the, the, the typical way of doing this budget is I would get the budget together and we'd meet on a Wednesday and do our opening statements and then I'd let you see what the budget is. And then the next day we'd do amendments until we tired of amendments. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give it to you several days or a week in advance if you'll agree to provide the amendments 24 hours before we do the voting. 
So people can look at them and see what's responsible and see if there need to be some counter amendments and that sort of thing. Um, we didn't get agreement on that. But I think we have some agreement now to start doing that so that it becomes a more bipartisan approach to uh, responsible amendments with some limitations on the amendments. Um, now, I'll talk about some bigger reforms. Some, I think those are pretty big, but there are bigger ones that we could do, need to do, but they're a little, little tougher to sell. Um, we need to have a new budget commission, like the BRAC Commission or Simpson-Bowles. Um, I was one of the co-sponsors of that original budget commission and was kind of disappointed that some of the co-sponsors dropped off of there and we didn't have enough votes to do the... Uh, do the commission. But President Obama said we're going to do a commission. He appointed Bowles and Simpson to head it up and, and they did it. Um, but I think more participation by more members of the House and Senate would get a little bit of more agreement and if they were able to break that down into pieces I think there'd be more of a possibility of getting it, getting it through and then we could vote on it in pieces as well. But it would be an up or down vote. It wouldn't be an amendable vote. And I think that could make some huge, uh, huge changes. Another one that I'm pushing for is to have the Finance Committee each year set the spending guardrails. The Finance Committee does taxes, that's the revenue. So they can figure out what it's logical that they can do during the year and what it's logical that those taxes that are already in place will bring in. And uh, so I'd have them set this guardrail, and it would be based on the revenue that's anticipated and the interest rates. It'd be a debt-to-GDP formula, and we would vote on it. And then we would have to stay within that as we did the budget process. I'd also like to see us go to biennial budgeting. I think it's essential that we go to biennial budgeting. There isn't any entity in the world that deals with as many dollars as the federal government does. And uh, we don't ever look at it. You know, we're going to have an omnibus this year. That means that a couple of people are going to sit down in a room and figure out what all the great expenditures are for this country. Um, there's no relationship between the committees and the appropriation subcommittees. Um, I know that Lindsey Graham said that he and Pat Leahy sat down and, and worked out the foreign relations budget in a few hours. Well, there's anybody on that subcommittee from foreign relations. <laughs> and uh, they think they ought to have some input into how the foreign relations money is spent. That's why we have the authorizing process. But the authorizing process is a little out of whack. The first year I was budget chairman, I noticed that there were 260 uh, programs that were expired, that we were spending money on. And it was $293.5 billion a year. That's a lot of money. So I harped on that a lot. And uh, the next year, we were down to 256 from 260. But we spent $310 billion. We increased the amount of spending on the ones that we still had that weren't authorized. You got to look at the programs at a regular basis, but there's no incentive to do that. You know, who gets any credit for going back and eliminating a program? I can tell you from eliminating programs, you don't get credit for it. You catch hell. <laughs> but it has to. It has to be done. Um, so, another thing that we could do is have a regulatory budget. And I think this is absolutely essential. This is an idea we got from one of our hearings from Canada. In Canada, the way it works, in order for you to do a new regulation, you got to eliminate an old regulation. So we've got to have some incentive to go back and look at the, look at the uh, old programs and, and old regulations that we've done. Now, they didn't get into having it have to be the same amount of dollars as the new one. That would be a, a, a good goal as well. But... They started out by just wanting to get rid of some old ones so that they could, before they did new ones. And one of the things that they did was to make a regulatory budget where each agency could get credit for ones they eliminated without doing a new regulation. So that they'd have a little storehouse of possibilities when it came time to do a regulation. 
We thought that was a pretty good idea. And we ought to have a capital construction budget. Right now, if we say we're going to build a new ship over the next five years, we put the money in this year. And then the president gets to allocate how much of that gets spent each of the years. And uh, it, is, it is possible to run out of money for the five years before you get to the five years, even if there aren't cost overruns, which usually confuse the process a whole lot too. So a capital construction budget would, would help a lot. So essentially what I'm saying is we need some honest accounting, we need some more detailed accounting, we need some more timely accounting. And uh, I, I think we're on a path to maybe getting that done. I was hoping that it would be done before the election. That's part of the reason why we've had this bipartisan approach to it. Uh, as we've been working on it, nobody knew who was going to be the majority in the Senate. Nobody knew who the president was going to be, and we still don't. But up until we do, we can be very reasonable protecting our own rights. <laughs> Afterwards, the majority will probably want to uh, make some drastic changes on their own. And that doesn't work very well. You have to have both sides committed to these things, particularly the budget, because times change. So we do know, oh, on, on, I've got to go back to my biennial budgeting one more time because I left out the fact that I really think we ought to do six budgets each year. And we do the six tough ones right after an election and the six easy ones before the next election. And that would give us a little more opportunity to put some traction in it, but it would also make that two or three months that we set aside to do the budgets feasible to get some detail into it, which is something we, we really need to do. Um, we could do a biennial budget, and that's worthwhile anyway, because then every agency would know for two years the money that they have to spend. And somebody said that should save us 5% just on that, that spree spending that they do right at the end of the year to make sure they use their whole budget so they have an excuse for needing that amount of budget again next time. Um, so we'd only do that kind of spending once every other year. So we do know what to do. Got to remember, we just want one more dessert before one more election before we go on the diet. Thank you for your attentiveness.